Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Inkwell Podcast. Our today's guest is an American-Ukrainian author, Alexander Semnyuk. Alex is a prolific writer. He has written over 20 books and is currently posting some of them in an audio format on his Substack. In today's episode, we talked about Alex's new book, his future projects, matters relating to faith, and finally, history. This is our second conversation on the show, and if you would like to listen to the first one, I will put a link to it in the description notes below. Enjoy. All right, and we're live once more, six months later. How are you doing, Alex? Good, good. How are you doing? Perfect. It's nice to have you back. Six months have passed, and I bet a lot has changed in your personal life, in your professional life, and in life in general. So, what's new? Yeah, a, a lot. Of, yeah, a lot. That's true. Uh, we moved to a new location, living wise, and I actually got two new book contracts since then. Uh, one came out at the end of the summer, and um, I'm actually doing a recording chapter by chapter of it, a chapter per week on my blog. It's called a, a peaceful town, mm -hmm. and the other one, I got the contract in late November, and it's it's gonna come out sometime this year. Uh, I don't know when yet. So that's kind of main things as far as you know, professional and then the big move. And we got a dog, so he's here with me right now. Nice, so, yeah. very calm looking dog looking through the window at the rain. So. Does, do does your dog ever give you ideas for your books by any chance? Just like observing him? Does any has anything answered the books from him? Mm. Good question. I wonder if it did in the new book. I can't remember. It usually slips something in there, you know, from personal life always. <clears throat> but I can't recall at the moment. But I'm sure I probably slipped something small in there. <laughs> Well, there's a funny little book in Lithuanian. Uh, it's actually a book on philosophy from probably our most famous uh, philosopher, Arvid Schlageris. And uh, actually, that book is called Bulves Metaphysica, or in English, uh, Metaphysics of a Potato. And uh, <laughs> that book is actually kind of came, came about of just like watching his dog, how he's staring at things. And like uh, contemplating, like, what well, what's up there? <laughs> so, so it's it's funny that <laughs> most of the ideas actually came uh, to him from observing his dog, and uh, well, the name says it all. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's really funny. It's original. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's quite. <laughs> So, so I just uh, thought, like, uh, maybe it's a common thing between riders <laughs> observing their pets. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i mean observation in general yeah like looking at people um yeah it's it's when you look at like people or things around you like in a cafe or street or whatever yeah always, always some ideas in there yeah last last book i wrote peaceful town i just got a lot of it from just walking at night in the neighborhood just looking around and so the scenery the homes and stuff like that Nice. So what's the main premise of the book? Uh, what's the main idea? What's the story? Uh, a Peaceful Town is, is a little, uh, it was a uh, kind of a new uh, way for me, a new concept where I mixed, <clears throat> I mixed pretty much every type of perspective, first person, third person, whatever, a mix of it. And, um, it's the first book I wrote where a villain is the main character. Mm -hmm. And it's also unique in a sense that every chapter, well, not every chapter, but almost every chapter is about a different different character in this town. Mm -hmm. And something connects them in each chapter to this main villain. And some of the chapters is just him, his perspective, but all the other chapters is, you know, investigator or the hunter or a family that owns a business there. So, and it's, in this perspective, it's a unique book. I've never done anything like that. So, 
Um, and that's kind of my goal now, just to do things I have I haven't not done yet. Mm -hmm. So it was a really good experience, and I was really happy to you know get a contract for it. So, and I think I think people who are listening chapter by chapter each week are enjoying it too. Um, but it is it's a more on a thriller horror side, so with some dark humor in there. So, so two questions. <laughs> Not here. for everybody. So two questions here. Uh, question number one, where are the people listening to the book uh, chapter by chapter? And question number two, uh, just because not that long ago I have read Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment, where the main character is also kind of an antagonist. Well, he's a murderer. He kills uh, two people. And uh, it also has many characters uh, involved in the, this directly or indirectly and uh, having relationships with the main character. So it kind of shows his psychology and his uh, mentality and how he sees the world and thinks about it. And I'll, But also like shows him in more depth in relationship to the other characters as well. So for some reason, maybe it's just because it's a, re a recency bias. I have just read the book, uh, but hearing about an antagonist and like different kind of uh, characters having their own chapter and so on, I thought, is it any way similar to this kind of style of writing or or is it a little bit uh, from a different point of view so you can you can start from whichever question you would like either the easier or the or the harder one <laughs> okay quick easy one is uh the so the episodes are released on Substack my blog and then they automatically go to Apple as well. So if you type in a peaceful town at Apple podcasts, it'll pop up there chapter by chapter every week cool. also. So that's the <clears throat> easy one. The hard one. Yeah. Dostoevsky. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite writers of all time and a genius. I, uh, um, you know, I'm not even close to that level. I mean, it's not even, you know, where but uh the reader should be the judges <laughs> the yeah the depth the depth he has the detail of um the character's psyche and their spiritual you know uh condition it's is just so, so amazing how he could you know get into get into it and show how uh people the, the internal turmoil people have and how they are people are in the gray area you know his characters are also realistic so it's it's pretty amazing um as far as comparing the two characters in the books um it uh, in my book the character is more uh you know straightforward kind of psychopath you know right it's more de devious uh egotistical very self-centered i would say it's more um the way i created this character is just studying um um psychopath real ones serial killers i watched a few interviews so pretty scary stuff but important for if you want to create a character in that type of psyche so um you kind of have to put your mind into that place which can can be kind of stressful so but you know you have to if you want to make the character accurate in that way so it's it's more of that you know self-centered completely self-absorbed egotistical a person who sees the world as you know only through his lens so that's yeah uh, that's definitely a different, you know, different type of character in that sense. Like narcissist slash psychopath, that yeah. kind of a person. Yeah. Well, well, I think it's very important because most people probably don't uh, even consider how many of these kind of people are actually around them and you just don't notice them because many sociopaths, many psychopaths or narcissists, they're really able to actually integrate themselves well into the society and um, unless you cross over paths and you know you might become a victim of this kind of a person or you, 
or you might just like uh, notice that a guy or a girl or a person in general is just like off and you don't know why, but uh, there could be real depths and horrors uh, there and you just never know with whom do you cross paths. And maybe mm-hmm. I'm speaking about this because lately in Lithuania, there has been quite a few child snatching uh, events. And uh, I don't know why. Maybe our ge- geography is not uh, very well suited because we're like uh, most of the time a country where k- people cross paths. Uh, you know, it's like uh, this kind of a uh, open space of land, uh, like the plateau, European plateau. Uh, so, so, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's horrible, it's scary. So, it also maybe like reading this type of books can get a person thinking, people thinking more about like um, who they encounter in a peaceful little town that they <sighs> expect it to be different from what it actually is. So that's that's a, that's an interesting uh, point of view there. Yeah, it's interesting you say that too, because that's one of the you know uh, things that does happen is this person is you know liked by people in the town and they view him as this respectful, clean guy. But then you get into his you know men- mental internal mm-hmm. state and you see a completely different picture. So yeah, it's a very very interesting point and it does make you wonder, you know. <laughs> yeah, intriguing. Well, well, well. <laughs> intriguing. And uh, you have mentioned that there is also another story spinning in your mind. Uh, and as I understand, now you're always trying to do something a little bit different to get out of your comfort zone as a writer and as a storyteller. So, what can maybe your readers or fans uh, expect uh, from the new book that is just. Uh, it's still, I believe it's still like in a writing phase, in a draft phase, or maybe it's only in the thinking about it phase. No, this one, this one is done. Um, the one that's due out this year is done and the publisher has it, Mm, but they just don't know, uh, the date yet for their schedule is kind of heavy. So it could be, be somewhere, maybe fall. I'm not sure, but We'll we'll see. Yeah. So this this is a uh, and as it, I said in the last interview, every time I finish a book, I think it's my last one. <laughs> yeah, I've heard this one. I this remember. one I thought was going to be my last one. <laughs> uh, maybe it is as far as just uh, individual writing. I don't know. But um, so this book is also something I wanted to do for a while. I just never done, and you know, I finally got around to it. I, I've always liked uh, it, the history of New Orleans, mm-hmm. like the culture, food they came out of there, and music. My favorite music is jazz. My favorite food is you know Louisiana cuisine. So, um, so so I finally got around to it. So I wrote this. Um, it's a horror set in first half of 18th century and a huge chunk of a uh, huge uh, part of it chunk of it is like history of the place mixed with how the character grows up so the first part of the book uh, kind of long part is the character from birth to till he's 40 years old and it, it's mixed with actual real history of the city and some history overseas during that time, stuff like that. And then kind of when he's in his 40s, that's the rest of the story and what, what happens. So it's it's something I wanted to do for a while. It has a different format from other books too. It just has six long chapters. So it's mm-hmm. only six chapters. Each chapter is really long. So a different format. Um, yeah, and I once I finished it, I thought that's it. I felt like I was so burned out with book writing. And I, I finished it, I think, in, around end of summer. And I still haven't started writing a new book, but I I found some people actually on Substack, the blog, I found some amazing, uh, amazing, amazing writers. And what I'm 
looking to do now is to co-write a book Ooh. with someone else as as my next project. And I, I I think I found some people, so so we'll see. You know, it's just in the kind of setting up stages and seeing if it'll work, what will work. But cool. Uh, it's definitely something I want to do. That the, it it got me excited again, you know, because nice. as, as far as just writing books on my own, my own books, I kind of felt like I've done everything I wanted. The only thing maybe in the future is to just write a story of my family, starting from early last century <clears throat> and when communists came, and all the way till you know, the move to US. And I would have to obviously gather a lot from my parents for that. And but that's a project for the future. I, I think an, that's a possibility. That's a very interesting so, one. That's a very interesting yeah. project because, uh, well, first things first, um, do you have the documents and the stories from your ancestry? Or did you use some kind of a service? Like, uh, I think there's uh, a couple of different even websites, I don't remember. My Heritage, I think that's one. It kind of helps you to build your family tree and it just tracks different kind of documents. And uh, there's another one that I don't remember, but uh, I even, even also thought of using it just out of curiosity. So that's a very interesting one. And your family has been spread through a few different uh, continents. It started in Europe. Uh, it's uh, carried on to the United States. Uh, your uh, your wife is from Latin America, so there's like a lot uh, happening there. It might be a very interesting mm -hmm. story, you know, like mixing. And also <laughs> there's the communists, as you have said, like the Soviet era. Unfortunately, people really romanticize it, those who haven't experienced it. So they're thinking like, wow, this is something like uh, nothing to romanticize, unfortunately. Sorry, guys, uh, nothing good happened there. <laughs> yeah, pretty horrible. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's 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 we've done some searching and stuff back she because of uh because of the communists a lot of the you know documents and everything was destroyed because okay. my great great grandfather was a priest mm. and uh a farmer and you know the communists targeted priests first so you know they they killed him and most of the family um, well, most of the stuff was lost, but, um, the boys, like, uh, they survived basically living in forest and later, you know, they've said they were orphans. So my grandfather, <clears throat> he, so, you know, suffered with the communists and later he joined the military and he actually fought World War II for five years. So wow. the whole, the whole time. So Nazis, communists, a lot. <laughs> I could write a lot, you know, about a lot of different things just in that time. And of course, my parents have a lot of, you know, their own stories during their, their time, you know, like, because during their time, Soviet Union was different than in the first half too. So it's still different perspectives as well to compare, you know, and see what was bad, what was good. And obviously, personal stories are interesting also. And uh, I actually have, uh, because of the services I used for DNA, um, a relative in Boston found me. Hmm. And he, he's on my dad's side. And uh, his side, I can't remember who it was, but they also escaped around... The, the communist time mm -hmm. to us mm. so and yeah he found me through the services and i met him and you know he he brought me a gift and it's it's really nice i we stay in touch so it's it's pretty cool that something like that can happen yeah um, they, That's they have all these all these things now it's it's amazing <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Well, that's also a story that I would be really looking forward to because, uh, you know, uh, in our history, it's a big moment in time. Most of the time, a very sad one because of deportations. Like, I, I think if I'm not mistaken around, 
350,000 people were deported from Lithuania to Siberia. And uh, that's in a you know, few decades. And uh, not to mention the deaths uh, in the Second World War and so on. So there's uh, and deaths in Lithuania. So it's a, it's a horrible uh, time. And uh, well, let's all hope that the world is not entering uh, another similar time right now. Uh, let's hope that uh, we are actually able to learn from history, which most of the time seems not to be the case with human beings. And we have like this uh, delete button. And now I, f I think the last actually, um, the last generations that actually experienced the Second World War are now in their 90s, like my grandmother, she, she was born when Hitler was elected president, so 1933. So she's an old timer and um, she still can share the stories, you know, of, of what life has been at those times. But uh, after her, you know, it's only historic records and people distance themselves more because there's no one to actually tell the stories. There's only something to read about. And, uh, you know, it was actually very startling for me when I heard that actually there's a significant population in the U.S. and elsewhere that believed that Holocaust never existed, like it never was a thing. So I guess like with, uh, especially with the current uh, circumstances and AI and deep fake videos, uh, it, it's going to get very messy in the future to say like what happened yeah. or what have not so, so we're entering a very odd time, uh, but I would be really into reading uh, memoirs from like your family side as well. So that's yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah and it's it's interesting you mentioned uh, the AI, but um, yeah, I've actually seen like uh, posts by famous people that you know they post post like a picture or something. Yeah, and later find out that was AI generated and that was actually not happening. And they posted it as news, yeah. So it's just crazy to think about, and it looks real. So you need like these professional analysts who have to examine it to see. It's it's crazy, and now AI writes, you know, writes books, stories. So it's it's just it's it's too crazy to think about. Like I've I've seen them. I've seen them. Uh, I've seen some people on blogs where I know their style and how they write. Yeah. And suddenly it becomes this kind of very without personality writing. It's the same subjects and you know they're using AI. Mm. But I guess in the future AI will be able to adjust even to that, like, you know, to the style of a person or whatever. So it's just, it's crazy to think about that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, uh, with the same token, when you think about the AI writing and you think about the AI videos and, uh, you know, <laughs> I think not that long ago we saw an excerpt from Joe Rogan's podcast uh, as a short. And then later we realized that was not Joe. <laughs> that was uh, AI generated Joe. And we were like, what the heck? It, it looks so real. <laughs> and, at the wow. and at the same time, you know, let's, let's be honest, not all of us are... Um, expert analysts most of us are really gullible naive people you know you don't need ai for some people to believe every single conspiracy theory that is out there <laughs> you know with the yeah. ai with the ai there will be just more variety <laughs> to choose from yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's, it is it it would take a lot of um mental i think power to you know discern it's all of it it's just you, you, it's just an overload you know yeah. and uh that's why i i am no longer on most of social media i pretty much just have my blog it's it just feels better too it's it's a, it's a good decision and i've seen others who've done it and they just feel so much better about it <laughs> well let's speak a little bit more about your blog because you also mentioned that uh, now you have uh, moved, make, well, you made a move from Medium to Substack mainly. Uh, I don't know if you still post on Medium, but I know that if people want to find uh, your works, they should go to your Substack. And uh, well, first things first, I just wonder what encouraged you to 
uh, move platforms to change to, to Substack? Was there an, a specific uh, thing why, or just you decided to try something new? And also, like uh, for people who want to read more from Alex, not just his books, reading books is the best thing. But if you want to get a little bit more personal and, you know, see like your photos uh, that you post, your short uh, little uh, articles there as well. Like what do people, what could people expect from uh, checking out your Substack? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I made the move. I, so yeah, Medium was a, um, a good experience as far as just learning, learning about writing and, you know, making blog posts. And I got a lot of experience on there and, uh, Substack is definitely a good next step. Mm -hmm. I, I and I've been just amazed at seeing how many just great famous writers and writers who are not known also just amazing. There's a huge amount, huge amount of talent on there. And uh, like you said, um, on the Substack platform, you have a, a lot of options to to get more personal. Mm -hmm. besides posting your blog you can also create a podcast and their podcast you can connect to apple podcast spotify or any other platform you prefer to use it's very simple very smooth very nice process on on top of that you you have something called notes which is uh similar to how a facebook status you know, works and you can just post your little thoughts for the day or a question to people on there. I, I post fo my professional photos on there. People enjoy those a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You really get, you get to know people this way and it does feel more personal. As, as far as my content on the, my main blog posts and podcast, it's, it's a mix of discussion about faith, um, psychology, society, and uh, fiction. So mm -hmm. I have a section for fiction on there, and I'm reading one of my books on there, which is fiction. And my podcast is all pretty much faith-based. And my, the blogs that I write on there, the articles are... Yeah, mix of psychology, society, and faith, and you know how people interact with each other. Um, I mix in some personal history in there as well. So it's it's I I like the variety, and it's been a really good experience so far. Cool. So this is more like from the user's point of view, like from a person that just wants to maybe read something interesting or listen to something interesting or maybe just uh, uh, wants to engage with an author or another creator on another level, uh, which is very cool because uh, if you like a person, there are certain platforms like Patreon or Substack in this regard where you can just uh, get to see a little bit more uh, from another side, from another point of view of like what the person is about and his uh, creation. But... Uh, yep. From the creator's point of view, um, so I kind of now get the feeling of what Substack provides for the uh, reader or listener, viewer, uh, but why is it a good platform for the creator, just as you? So, um, <clears throat> it's a news, it's an email newsletter, basically, so uh, if people, when people subscribe to you whenever you post next it goes straight to their email so mm -hmm. uh, obviously that's great because the more work you put in there the more subscribers and the more people are reading and you build 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 uh very easy to transfer all the emails from your other projects into there that's a benefit another option that i like a lot as an author in there is uh, you can you have a paid option so you can put everything as paid when you post 
So people will pay like, you know, five, let's say $5. You can set whatever price you want, but I, I put a $5 a month and, but you can do a mix. You can like, for example, my podcast is always free and it's always, always remains free on there. But for the posts, I, I mix it up. So some are paid users only, some are free. Another option I think is good is called archive. So after a certain amount of time, a post becomes paid. So I think most users have a set of two weeks. Mm -hmm. So after whatever has been published two weeks prior, all of that is locked as paid. So that's the benefit that someone who pays can have. And it's a nice option for the creator as well. Another good option for creators is you can start a private chat with either your paid subscribers Mm. or everybody and you can choose and this could be a benefit you can offer to paid subscribers like a private video chat that you schedule and they can just join so it's another interesting option and some people in there offer like classes or workshops this way if you're 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 paid a subscriber so Mm. that's nice um, sections is another good thing for the creator. You can, when someone goes to your page and you created sections, you can see, for example, mine has poetry and you click on there and that's where the poetry goes. You have guest writers and that's where my guest writers go. You have podcasts and that's where podcasts go. So it's, it's nice for me to mm-hmm. organize. It's nice for someone who comes to the page too they can easily just see what my podcast is about what my fiction is about so you don't mix fiction like you know you uh, you know i don't want to mix horror with a you know a post about jesus too much. <laughs> so so you know but it's it's nice option that you can kind of separate like a peaceful town i'm reading it it's separated in its own section so it's nice for me nice for the reader too so i i'm sure i'm forgetting some things but i think these are kind of main things i can think of right now that That's are beneficial nice. you can actually keep your your uh, creation your posts uh, everything that you put there very neat and it's a good uh, user experience for the readers and listeners so that's cool because uh, i'm also planning to launch a new podcast uh, but not uh, a podcast like this one this one is just uh, me being interested in people so talking with various writers or language enthusiasts, linguists, and people from various cultures, uh, the podcast that I will launch it will be more for my students and people who are learning Lithuanian. So it's going to be a podcast in Lithuanian uh, about uh, Lithuania, its history, culture, uh, many aspects related to it, and in a way that people could hear more of the language and you know just brainwash themselves with it because uh, i do that when i learn languages so that's how i managed to kind of get an intermediate level both in portuguese and in russian uh, which uh, unfortunately portuguese is an easier language than the former (laughs) and then the latter (laughs) it's a a terribly difficult language Yeah, my, my wife speaks Portuguese. She's Brazilian, and I speak Russian and Ukrainian. So that's funny you say that. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's interesting because uh, uh, one idea that I had during the New Year's was uh, to get a basic level, elementary level in Ukrainian, uh, just because where I live there are quite a few Ukrainian people, and most of them uh, speak. In Russian, but uh, I don't feel that it's always polite to speak to Ukrainian people in Russian because uh, some Ukrainians boycott the language and they don't speak in Russian. They only speak, let's say, in English or Ukrainian. And uh, I have never come across a person that is boycotting the language, but I 100% understand why they ought or why they might do that. And uh, just as a person who speaks both languages, um, Interestingly enough, I have heard that uh, Ukrainian has a little bit more linguistic similarity with Polish than with Russian. So there is more crossover in terms of uh, phonetics, pronunciation, vocabulary. 
And uh, from your point of view, um, how different and how similar are these two languages? Uh, meaning Russian and Ukrainian. Let's put the Polish yeah. out of the way for now. Yeah. Uh, well, well, my mother is actually fluent in Polish, and oh, wow. yes, yeah, there is. It's it's it, there is you know Ukrainian is definitely closer. Um. um yeah. I, so usually Ukrainians, Ukrainian speakers can understand Russian very easily, but Russian speakers will struggle to understand Ukrainian. And mm. I think in this sense, it's uh, would be similar to. Portuguese speakers or Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Or like for my wife, it's very easy to learn and understand uh, Spanish mm -hmm. and actually French too. But, you know, it's harder for a Spanish speaker to un in understand anything as far as Portuguese. So that's the type of uh, comparison. Um, I'm also learning Swedish now and <laughs> a lot of words are similar to ukrainian which is really uh, really surprising but then again i thought about it and it's not so surprising because the vikings from sweden came to the you know now now ukrainian lands yeah, and uh, established there so and spanska is really old old north language so a lot of these <clears throat> words they go all the way back so it's it's just amazing to see some of the words that are you know same on you know a Russian too Russian too like just on top of my head I can think of like billet you know mm -hmm. it's ticket mm -hmm. and it's Spanska but it's same in you know Russian so it's it's just it's just interesting to see how languages you know where the origins from and how they overlap um, the similarities and I guess the more you study the more you see the similarities, especially in Europe, I think, except for Finnish. I, I, I think that's, that's something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, it's funny. Well, two, two things. First thing, bilet uh, in Lithuanian would be biletas. So if <laughs> there used to be a joke uh, that Russian speakers in Lithuania after the Soviet Union uh, used, that uh, if you want to speak Lithuanian, you just have to add us everywhere. So like uh, Tom <laughs> becomes Thomas, Luke becomes Lucas, <laughs> and so uh. on. Of course, <laughs> this was just a joke. Uh, these two languages are very different, but uh, for certain <laughs> words like bilet and biletas, it's actually the case. <laughs> and, That's uh, really funny. And the second thing is, mm -hmm. it's really cool, like, uh, because uh, two years ago, I think when uh, Timothy Snyder released his uh, YouTube course, I think he's a professor in Yale University, but he just made one of the university's courses uh, public. Uh, so just a regular Joe like me, I uh, can listen to a full series of Yale lectures about uh, Ukrainian history, uh, which covers a lot about Kiev and Rus, uh, Lithuanian Grand Duchy, uh, the, the Muscovy, you know, like po Polish Kingdom and the Lithuanian Commonwealth and, you know, all the jazz of the Central and Northern Europe. And it's super interesting to listen to a person from the United States uh, speak about your own region because it feels like the person will have less bias than, let's say, a Lithuanian speaking about it because... Of course, the Lithuanians are going to speak how great Lithuanian Grand Duchy was and how terrible the Lublin Union with, with Poland. <laughs> and the Russians will say, well, all of this is nonsense. All of you are Russians with different names. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's such a, just such crazy stuff. Uh, but when you, you get a person a little bit uh, outside of the whole thing, which specializes in that area, uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, lecture series. And um, I have been recently reading his book, uh, Reconstruction of Nations, which speaks about uh, Lithuania, Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine from 1569 to 1999, which is uh, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's a very nice audio book. I found it on Audible as well. So it's quite it's quite intense, but fun. Very informative as well. Take care of that stuff. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so like even when you said uh, Kim and Rus and some people cannot make an association, well, how does Vikings and Ukraine come together? Well, Kiev was a major Viking trading post in the 11th century, like and because through the Dnieper River, you can go to Byzantium. Mm -hmm. So it's like across a center but between Byzantium and Scandinavia, more or less, something I like that. A book up uh, on that. Um... It's, it's, uh, people like it on my blog. I posted the whole thing. It's a short novella. Really? It's called Everlasting Candle. And it, it takes place during that time. Um, so that's interesting. We're talking about it now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's, it's a fascinating time. It's when, uh, also the, the church split, mm -hmm. the, the Roman me. and, yeah, schism, yeah. So it's a really interesting time and all these great cathedrals that still stand in Ukraine or, you know, they were built then, which is amazing. Um, so it's, a, yeah, yeah, great, great time to write about or talk about, discuss it, yeah. Well, <laughs> also that's a good topic for us to kind of uh, continue here a little bit because uh, your blog is about, uh, I'm sorry, not your blog, your podcast is about faith. And uh, for most people that uh, know a little bit about uh, history of religion or like European history in general, uh, will know that uh, Ukraine uh, is an Orthodox country, mainly. Part of it is Orthodox, part of it is Catholic, because one part is more was more in the Polish influence, another part was more in the Muscovy influence. So just by the line of Dnieper, mainly. I believe if I, if I understand correctly and, and while you when you moved to the United States, the uh, United States is Protestant mainly, uh, I think uh, like in general, of course, mm. there's many different varieties of uh, Christianity in the U S uh, so, but you were exposed to very many different types of Christianity and it, what it means to be a Christian throughout your life. So I never asked you this question. I'm very curious, like, uh, how do you see all of these splits and schisms and differences and uh, using three fingers instead of two? You know, like there's so, so many different kinds of things that uh, we should not fight about, <laughs> but maybe there are some that we ought to. So I'm just curious from your point of view, like from your view on, what is your view on faith and how do you see people who are always quarreling about that? Yeah, it's a huge subject. I've actually just made a post that a lot of people were discussing just yesterday. Um, and it's such a big topic that, you know, I've, I've literally written probably over 100 things on it. All right. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> it is fascinating because I think all uh, all of the splits and different sects and these different different opinions it's all um how should i put it it's it's a human factor it's you know the big ego the human ego in the way and you know trying to make the other wrong <clears throat> um to say that, you know, I hold the absolute truth and how it should be and mm -hmm. the way it should be. And it's focusing on each other's mistakes. Um, so it's, it's, it's fascinating to see this because, um, you know, it's very, uh, I would say, different opposite of what, you know, Christ would was teaching in a church for Christ was, you know, a believer in him and in the God, Holy Spirit, and in his teachings. And I mean, that that's, if I'm, if I meet, you know, a Protestant, a Catholic, a non-denominational, mm -hmm. And it's, if you just speak to them about purely 
uh, how do they believe they should live according to Christ? The answers will be very similar. Mm -hmm. he, but then you get into the, you know, the church life and, you know, that's, that's, they get angry and upset and I fall into this trap sometimes too, mm -hmm. but it's, it's just fascinating to see that, oh. you know, like I think for a Christian, it's the, the focus has to be, you know, Christ and that's why it's Christian. You know, the focus has to be on Christ and on God. And I also see that people engaged in almost idol worship without even realizing it or an obsession of our rules, mm -hmm. church rules and these often are not are rules that have nothing to do with what Christ was teaching. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot to discuss and, you know, you can go through a lot of different little specific things. And some people will say, well, this is wrong or this is wrong. My it really, you know, like, uh, like I have a, Look, look, I always have this in my pocket, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a rosary. Yeah. But um, uh, Orthodox have prayer rope, like a prayer rope. The tradition goes back, way back, way back. Um, I, I, I don't want to mess this up, but maybe as far back as second century. Mm-hmm. Even I think the Desert Fathers, I, I could be mistaken, but you know, they would have a prayer rope and each knot will represent a psalm and they would learn all of the psalms. And so their prayer will be to repeat every psalm. Mm -hmm. that would be a prayer and then there would be a Jesus prayer in there too. This is the old tradition. And there's, there's no wrong or right here. You don't have to have a prayer rope. But if you do, someone who's saying you're wrong about it, I don't think they're right. <laughs> Cause you know, this is the way you want to pray. That's, uh, that's, that's good. That's okay. But if you don't want to pray with that, that's fine too. You, you're praying to God, to Jesus. And you know, if you truly believe and your, your heart is open, it doesn't matter for me. I like to do it this way, but if you don't want to do it with it, that's good too. So, so that's just one simple example how you know people will not only argue but they'll take it to an extreme um and then it builds and builds and builds um so you know some people will hate um the catholic church because you know catholic church is a pope um other people will hate hate is a strong word but they really do feels like it's a strong hate. feeling as well uh, so some people will you know feel this way about protestant church and their history so it's yeah yeah it, it's it's very, very interesting i could i could probably go on i don't want to take too much time on this well, but i could probably just I can... go on I can put my two, two cents uh, worth of uh, <laughs> perspective on this, <laughs> but <laughs> I like uh, what I came to while I was listening to you in my mind is that uh, uh, I have a great uh, friend, uh, which used to be my history teacher, and he, he's a very bright man. I think when I met him, he was in his late 50s or 60s. Now he's probably in his 70s. We still... Uh, talk once in a while over Skype or something like that. And he made a very good distinction for me uh, um, some time ago between two different types of, not two different types of religions, but two different types of religion. Uh, and he kind of formed it in this kind of concept says uh, that people ought not to be fooled by the words themselves, but he 
formulated as esoteric and exoteric religion. So one more, one more going towards the teaching and the content and the actual essence of the religion. And the other one is more about the formulations, the institutions, uh, the different practices, rituals, and so on. So one more focuses on the content and another one more focuses on the form. So most of the time when you said, like when you go into the real teaching of Christianity, it doesn't really matter which denomination or, you know, type of Christianity it is. Like most of the time people will agree on the essence of it. Uh, but when they think about the exoteric, the, the ropes, the institutions, the ways you stand and, you know, the, I would say a little bit, uh, I hope I won't offend anything, but the more superficial matters, uh, it's really easy to get hung up on it and to start quarreling about that, where when the essence should be going on the essence of the thing, because that's what it's all about, and not on not just on the physical expression, but on the on the content. So, so that kind of uh, came to my mind uh, when I was listening to it. Uh, do you think that I kind of uh, caught your idea uh, correctly here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yes, that's a that's a good that's a good summary for it. <laughs> cool, very nice. And I guess uh, it would be very interesting also to listen a little bit more about that. So for anyone who ought or would like to do that, uh, you know, check out Alex's podcast as well. I will link it in the description notes below. Uh, together with his Substack and um, all of the other relevant information, so you can just like click uh, below and like go straight in. So, so that could be curious. So, uh, you have already spoken a little bit about your possible, uh, family's memoir, uh, a story that could emerge from that. Uh, but, uh, is there anything uh, else uh, on the plate, uh, or at least in the back of your minds uh, that might, uh, go into fruition in the upcoming year, like 2024 has just started. It's uh, what only eight days uh, since uh, since the new year. Well, depending on which calendar you follow, but let's speak about the Gregorian one here. <laughs> so, yeah, so what's what, so what's ahead? <laughs> um, this year, so co co write a book. Yeah, it's one of my goals. Um, but I'm not. I, I'd take it easy, you know. It's. Yeah. It's going to be a fun project, and I just want to take it easy as far as that goes. Um, more focus on the blog, pretty much. Just just getting consistent, consistent, decent quality things out there. <clears throat> and it's, uh, I mean, it's a lot of work too. So, just I think that's that's my main focus. And then, of course, the new book. Uh, but I don't know when. <clears throat> so that's going to be fun for sure. But out outside of those things, uh, not not much right now, I think. Um, something always seems to come up eventually. <laughs> Naturally. But it does seem like a lot as far as just, uh, you know, doing a good job on the blog mm -hmm. and really keeping my focus on there. Uh, podcast, all this, all those things, the readings. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Well, and also, you know, you still have to have time for yourself, for your your own reflections, and for your own inner life. Not everything has to be on paper. You know, <laughs> that that would be an overextension. <laughs> so, so you mm -hmm. you need like fruits inside, so you can get the buds out. <clears throat> So, so, so I hope that this uh, year is going to be plentiful for you, not just in the external, you know, manifestations, but like internally as well. So, so yeah, a little bit late, but happy 2024. Happy new year. <laughs> you too. Thank you so much. Yeah. For you too. I, you know, this is going to be a year and your podcast is going to be huge. Uh, I, I would love to. <laughs> Let's see if millions. the other people will love as well. <laughs> the millions of of viewers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do hope that they will come to listen to us speak the third time. Uh, maybe uh, still in 2024, maybe 2025. But uh, I love these conversations. You have a very nice uh, 
energy to you and you have a very good mood and it's uh, it's always delightful to speak with you alex really really thank you for yeah. joining in thank you yeah i love i love it um it's you know it's the same it can be said about you and honestly like after our last talk the people who um you know watch tell me about how they felt they said you know he's such a nice guy and you know he has such a good energy you you, you know? <laughs> well thank you so, so, yeah they just love how you conducting the interviews and it, yeah for for anyone you know watching um it's i highly recommend you know your your podcast and i know there's going to be a lot of great authors and individuals coming on your podcast this year i'm sure thanks it's, man it's really appreciate that great fun. yeah yep yep well you know the 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 sad part of it is that you don't always uh, meet nice people around you and you're like really close vicinities you know you don't always have a chance to have a one hour long in-depth conversation about things that truly matter to you on an everyday everyday basis so if you manage to find people and that's what I love about podcasts and internet and all of these lovely things nowadays that we have is you can be in another time zone in the US, you know, I can be here in Madeira, but we develop a connection and we're able to connect and speak about what truly infor feels important. And, you know, after the conversation, you feel changed a little bit inside. And I think, I think Peterson has said that I'm not huge on him, but this one was actually quite spot on. It's like, if you feel changed after a conversation in a positive way, that was a good conversation, you know? That's a that's a keeper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that yeah, that is that is a good observation, a good quote. <laughs> exactly. So let's hope for more more of this lovely, uplifting and you know, plentiful conversations in the next year. And yeah, I'll catch you next time. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much.